Father God, we just thank you for the word this morning. Father, we thank you that your word does not return to you void, but it's going to accomplish in our hearts that which you want. Father, we command the enemy to clear the airwaves today. We command scales to fall off every eyes. We command every deaf ear to be open to the word. We heed the Messiah's call that he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And Father, we choose to hear from your word today. And Father, we choose to be good ground that we will take it in and we will meditate on it and we will apply the kingdom and we will see that harvest in our lives of the kingdom of God being established in every area. And we thank you and we praise you for it in the name of Jesus. We are on part 15 of understanding the kingdom. And has anybody begun understanding the kingdom yet? We're starting to get there, aren't we? And it's not necessarily what we've been taught, although it's been in the Word of God all the time. Now, up until now, we have discovered you cannot save yourself. When the children of Israel and were in bondage in Egypt, it is a type and shadow of the spiritual state of every man on the planet. They could not deliver themselves. They could not get good enough. They could not get holy enough. God had to send a redeemer, and Moses is the perfect type and shadow of Messiah in the Old Testament. He went from on top of a mountain, in the presence of God, and he descended into Egypt. Jesus descended from heaven. He's the one who came from heaven, went into spiritual Egypt, delivered God's people. All they had to do was believe. You have to believe in what the Redeemer does. You have to believe in his message and in his ministry. And those that believe Moses got out of Egypt in this day and age, those that believe in the completed work of Christ get out of spiritual Egypt. We discovered that the, the, the pivotal place of them coming out is they were delivered by having the blood of the lamb over the doorposts. That's stage one. Secondly, they had to go through the Red Sea. When you go through the blood of Christ, you stop the Pharaoh from pursuing you. Anything from that moment forward is Egypt that you brought in your own pockets, not with him in the back. Then we found that they went into Mount Sinai and they, and they initiated the three-day principle. They washed for three days preparing to meet with God. And that, that is the origination of baptism. They met with God. They came in the blood covenant with God. The covenant was established, and out of the fire of God came the commandments of God. That was the first Shavuot. The first Shavuot after the resurrection of Jesus because the blood that Almighty God put over the doorpost of the earth was the blood of Messiah, and those that believe him and go through that blood unto redemption get freed from the Pharaoh of this world. So we have the, the Pentecost, the first 50 days after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We have that same fire that was on Mount Sinai descended on them, and the same spirit that gave the commandments now gave them the fire of God and the power of God to keep those commandments from within. I don't know about you, but that just preaches, and that is the proper biblical type and shadow. Now we come to the place of them getting ready to need to cross over the Jordan. And to be truthful, as I was putting this together, I thought, well, this session I'll deal with taking the promised land, crossing the Jordan. The next session we'll deal with the judges. I can't. There's too much in this one, one session. And as I got to doing the notes, I thought either I'm going to preach for three hours this morning or we're going to need to break it up at least into two sessions. So I want to start this morning with really understanding the kingdom, where we are now. And I actually want to start in the New Testament, Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. Because there was this expectation. And one of the things I'm dealing with in my new book, why don't we have the Apocrypha as a part of canon in the Jewish Old Testament? You see, one of the things that uh, I used to, you know, sometimes you go through seminary and you forget a lot of what you learn sometimes. And I had, for, you know, so, you know, I'm coming all these years later, just off of memory, thinking, well, you know, by the time of Jesus, the Old Testament canon was established. It wasn't. The Torah had been established since Moses, and the prophets had been established, but the writings, the Ketuvim, were still in flux in the day of Jesus. It was not until either the latter half of the first century A.D. or the first half of the second century A.D. that the rabbis established a Ketuvim and closed canon. 
So in the day of Jesus, the book of Enoch, that's why, that's why Jesus refers to it. Peter and Paul, they, they refer to it, and Jude literally clips and pastes right out of it because it was considered within the first century church as a possible part of canon. It was not until after Jesus and the rejection by by, by Judaism of Jesus because they did not fulfill their expectation of him being Messiah ben David, the conquering king. And so what the, one of the things they did is they stepped back and looked at all the Kedavim that were, that were floating around, including the book of Enoch, the book of Jasher, uh, J- uh, Jubilee and all this, and they looked for what caused the messianic fervor. Because you have the rejection of Jesus and you have, you have the, the, the zealots that caused the destruction of the temple in, in 70 AD. Then you have the second Jewish revolt where Simon Bar Kochba was coronated as the Messiah by Rabbi Akiva. And it caused not only, uh, there was no temple to be destroyed, but what they did is they literally uh, buried under, bulldozed over, if you will, all of Jerusalem and made it illegal that no Jew could even go into the Holy Lands. How I many know that's rough stuff? And so the rabbis looking back at that saying, you know what, this whole Messiah stuff, let's take all of that and throw that out. Now, we can't out of the prophets, but some of this stuff out of the writings, this is my theory that things like the book of Enoch, the book of Jasher, all those were thrown out because of the Messianic fervor, because that was part of within that, um, within that time period that caused such Messianic fervor among the Jewish people. Now, we, now then you jump. And to the establishing of the King James Version, some, some believe the King James Version floated down from heaven above. I, I do believe there is a specific anointing on it because very few people have ever had the dedication that those translators did. They were absolutely devout men of God that loved God with all their hearts. But what we don't know is that in the original 1611 King James Bible, there was the Apocrypha, and there sat the book of Enoch. And the book of Jasher, the book of Jubilees. And it stayed there for over 245 years. And, there was, and there's actually debate today on why we ever took it out. One theory is the publishers did it because it was, le- it was a lot less expensive to leave the Apocrypha out. Theory. The other one is there's some witchcraft and some of the other books, and so they took them out for that reason. But the Book of Enoch, the Book of Jasher, and the Book of Jubilees had never been in question. That is a modern phenomenon. Just want to throw that out. But they they always had this expectation of the kingdom being physically manifested around them. They were demanding that in Jesus' day. When are you going to come and establish the kingdom? I mean, I mean, right before he, he ascended, they're asking him the same thing that they asked him over and over again. When are you going to sit on the throne of your David? When are you going to drive out Rome? When are you going to do all these things? Not understanding that even, even encoded into Yahweh Elohim were the two comings of Messiah. The first one, as, the, as Messiah ben uh, Joseph, the suffering servant, the second one is Messiah ben David, is actually encoded into the minute God began to make man, he went from just being Elohim to Yahweh Elohim. It's encoded in that. And because he demanded all these things, that, that he was saying, listen, you guys don't get it. Just like a lot of people don't get it today, we want people, people want to forcibly enforce the kingdom of God and try to create a kingdom on the outside, and you can't do that because you don't have the kingdom on the inside. This is what I said all that to get us and set the stage here for Luke chapter 17. And it says that when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, when are you going to be Messiah ben David? He answered and said to them, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. It's not external. Listen to me, it's not external. You know, you can, this is one of the reasons, guys, you can try to build the perfect congregation and the moment that you take it beyond you, you got problems. And most of the time, if you were honest with yourself, sometimes all by yourself, you got problems. Because the kingdom of God has got to be on the inside. He said, neither say, lo, it is here, or lo, it is there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And one of the things that you discover after you come into the kingdom is you have spiritual territory on the inside. Now, I'm starting to deal with, with, uh, 
with uh, bringing together and unifying uh, super strength theory with the Word of God, and not only do we have higher spatial dimensions, your spirit has access to all higher sp spatial dimensions. That's why the Bible says, the moment I pray that the hope that's within me appears before the throne of God in the third heaven. My spirit man connects to that. My soul is the bridge between the spirit and the physical. And in my soul, I have spiritual territory that lower sec or second heaven dimensional beings can inhabit and infest with their ideas. That's the war that goes on after you get saved, which we're going to begin building the foundation for. So the greatest level of spiritual warfare, to be honest, which is either fighting somebody on the outside or fighting something on the inside. It's fighting something on the inside. If you get the inside battle won, the outside is always easy. Our problem is we're trying to stand against Beelzebub on the outside when he has a holiday inn built on the inside. He's got his own Disneyland with all his buddies built on the inside feeding us stuff and we're calling it the Holy Spirit and we're calling it a flesh out. That's warping our theology and now we're going to stand up because I got authority in Jesus and the minute that you begin to take dominion on the outside, you start getting beat up on the inside. It's because we don't understand the principles of what are being shown us in the word of God and even the types and shadows we see with the children of Israel going into the promised land. Everybody wants to talk about going into the promised land, but nobody wants to do it because once you cross over, now get ready because I'm getting ready to invoke a four-letter word. Work. Mm. <laughs> You see, there's some principles of crossing over the Jordan. Salvation is a principle of God saving us. The Torah, now listen to me, the Torah was never meant as a mechanism to save anybody. It was something given to those that had already been redeemed by a sovereign act of God. To take it out of that context because of a vain argument in the New Testament from the Shammai Pharisees that taught the Gentiles that they had to be physically circumcised to be saved, which was corrected in Acts chapter 15, was a wrong argument that the church corrected because they were trusting in a work of the flesh for salvation rather than in the completed work of Christ. But the whole of the argument was that and there was, did you notice in Acts chapter 15, there wasn't an argument about eating pork? It's because none of them were doing it, including the Gentiles, because they were god fears. They just gave them a little bit more instruction on kashrut. The way you kill the animal. Don't drink the blood, yo pagan. You don't strangle it. When you put it down, you put it down with honor and dignity. It is not a violent act. In fact, if you go today to a kosher meat plant that was run by rabbis, they simply slit his throat and they, pray, they lay their hands on it and thank God for this gift and give honor to that cow as it gently goes to sleep. Isn't that better than sticking something in his forehead and driving a nail through its brain? A violent act. God says, you don't, no, no, not by violence. So they had to give them some little bit more instruction. But it, 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 guys, it is impossible. When you look at the biblical story, the type and shadow in the Old Testament, nobody in bondage in Egypt could rise up. That's why when Moses tried in his flesh to rise up and to set them free, he ended up being driven into the desert because you can't do it in the flesh. He had to be sent from the presence of God on a mission and follow the type and shadow of who Messiah would be to do it. Therefore, now, the Torah can save the soul, not the spirit. What does that mean? It can renew the mind. It can get you to quit thinking like a slave and start thinking like a child of the kingdom. That's what 
James meant when he said, receive with meekness the engrafted word. When he wrote that, when the apostle Paul says, all scripture is profitable for doctrine, the New Testament didn't exist. It would not be codified for another couple of hundred years. They used the Old Testament to establish the church with the revelation of who Jesus was. But nobody in the early church got saved by keeping a work except obeying the command to believe. God must send a deliverer. Now in the Old Testament, it was Moses. And you need to mark this down. He is the perfect type and shadow of Jesus coming as Messiah ben Joseph. Why is the church today trashing the Old Testament example of who Moses was? What was the first miracle that Moses did? He turned water into blood. What was the very first miracle that Jesus did? He turned water into wine, and for a Jew, they're synonymous. He was saying, I, Moses was a type and shadow of me, and I'm walking in his footsteps. Come on. In the New Testament, it is Jesus. He fulfills the type and shadow of Moses. He is the Lamb of God that promised to Abraham who offered, a, who offered his life as a sacrifice for our sins on the exact same spot that Abraham was getting ready to sacrifice Isaac. Do you see maybe there's some types and shadows here? He conquered, del he de he he conquered death, hell, and the grave. That's exactly right. Blah, 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 blah. That's what I'm doing this morning when you try to put death, hell, and the grave together. And he rose victorious over them three days later, the three-day principle, and he is ruling and reigning today at the right hand of the Father. Now, I don't know about you, but that makes me happy. And we need to, the only way that you can get saved is you've got to believe in his completed work. Jew or Gentile, you got to come to the cross and you got to see that he is the Lamb of God, that he fulfilled the promise that when Abraham told Isaac, God will provide a lamb, that day he provided a ram to give a distinction. And when there was a prophet sitting on the bank of the Jordan River, and when he saw this guy coming, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That's Jesus. Now, crossing over the Jordan is a completely different dynamic. Guys, when you cross over, the manna stops. The cloud by day, the fire by night is no longer there. Now, you got to hear the voice of God. And guys, I don't need people emailing me saying, Mike, I want you to be a magic, magic eight ball, and I want you to tell me what I'm supposed to do. You got to hear from God, Jack. Your life is in your hands. I am commissioned of God to tell over the air what God has given me. But other than that, you better press in and you better hear. Why we want other people to hear for us is that we don't have to take accountability. And if it doesn't work, we can blame them instead of us. I remember I had a, a friend in ministry and, then, and he was a chaplain and these, this couple came to him. And, and said, we need marital counseling. And so he counseled them and counseled them and counseled them and counseled them until he was blue in the face. They got a divorce, and when they got a divorce, they sued him because they said it didn't work. You don't do that to Doyle. He countersued them for, not, for wasting his time and not doing what he told them to do. And he told the judge, if they had done what I told them to do, they wouldn't have got divorced. He said, they won't listen to each other. They won't listen to God. They won't listen to me. So they're their own problem. The judge says, case dismissed. Get on out of here. We've got to hear from God. We've got to do our own path. Now, when God uses servants to speak, you've got to hear that and add it to what God is speaking to you. It is a supplement. It's not your main diet. Oh, here's the next one. You got to hear his voice, you got to obey his commandments because your commandments, his commandments in those commandments are a way to recognize the enemy and how to fight the enemy. And then you got to drive the ites out of your inheritance. Ouch. But brother Mike, I want you to drive out the ites. I can't. Now there are times we're, we're going to see later on that when they when, in the time of Joshua 
that you would have different tribes come together for a specific purpose. I can have a gifting to assist you in the fighting, but if you're going to get in your lazy boy recliner and say, Mike, would you do the fighting for me? I'm walking away. If you're in the kingdom, you fight yourself. And then I can come and assist you in a specific fight. Then I go home and you continue the fight. And once you get the eyes cleared, then you can begin cultivating the kingdom. Oh, but we don't, we don't like that, guys. We don't want to fight. And that's why the church has no spiritual inheritance in this day. For folks that always default back to the salvation issue, and see if anybody has heard this, but I don't have to do that to be saved. Dumb, dumb, you don't have to do anything but to believe to be saved. But once you get saved, then you're called of God to roll up your sleeves. You see what happened? What this is that what this is symptomatic of is you refuse to cross the Jordan. You're just wandering around in the wilderness, not wanting to move past the salvation issue. Oh. Folks that default back to the salvation issue, I don't, want, I don't have to do that to be saved, have refused to cross over the Jordan and deal with their own giants. To move into the kingdom, we must be delivered. We must meet with God. We must hear his voice. We must receive his commandments. must receive the fire of his presence within because we are the tabernacle in the wilderness and we have got to cross over the Jordan to begin enforcing the kingdom within the land or the sphere of influence that Almighty God has given us. There's that four-letter word again, work. Salvation is not of works, but moving in the kingdom is. Ouch. And see, we had the first time, okay, they, they have seen Almighty God bring down the mightiest nation on the planet. Didn't have to lift a sword. They didn't have to lift a pen knife. They didn't even have to point a finger. God did it. To go to Mount Sinai, God almost blows up the top of Mount Sinai to make a point. I am the Almighty. If I took down a nation without you lifting a finger, imagine, imagine, imagine what you can do if I move through you. You saw me doing what I could do with one man that I sent from my presence with nothing but a staff he reduced Egypt almost to cinders. Imagine what I can do through you now that I've redeemed you and I put a sword in your hand. So they get to the Jordan. They send over 12 spies. The report comes back. There's giants over there. You need to realize there's some stuff in you that's bigger than you that can't be subdued without God in you and, and the finished work of Christ in you. You're no match for it, but it's no match for you and God. Come on now. They're saying there's giant. Now look at all the one, one in the promised land. And that this is what's keeping us from our abundance within and without. In the promised land... It took two men and a staff to carry one bunch of grapes. It flows with milk and honey. But you've got to drive out to eat the ites that are eating up your inheritance. <coughs> and so we pick up here in Numbers 13 and 30, and Caleb stilled the people before Moses. Here's an old man. Chill out, guys. Can you imagine thinking, we did, we did, did you see what God did to Pharaoh's armies? Do you remember all the, do you remember two months ago, three months ago, God did this? And so old Caleb is saying, you know what? Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. What are these giants compared to God? We're not... Didn't you go back to Mount Sinai? Did, we're now in covenant with the God who destroyed Egypt. We now have his tabernacle among us. We now have his commandments 
so that we can recognize the difference between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God. We, we got it all, man. Let's just go and let's take some of this and let's go open up, open up a can of whoopites. I am ready to take down some giants. I am ready to do this stuff. How about you? Well, the Bible says then the ten spoke up. But the men that went up, and this is in verse 31, and the men that went up with him said, Oh, we are not able to go against the people, for they are stronger than we. How many know that dynamic has been in existence at the beginning of time? The Nechesh of the Garden, the Watchers of Genesis 6, the principalities at the Tower of Babel. All of them have been stronger than us. Always. But you know what? Even when Abraham was just by himself, the pagans around him tried to make peace with him when he came back out of Egypt. They said, is it well with you? Is it cool, Abraham? Is it cool? I know you walk with God. See, there's some, guys, there's something that happens on the inside. When you're really walking with God, the problem with the ten spies is they were along for the ride and they hadn't started the walk yet. Caleb had started the walk. He says, you know what? Almighty God is walking with me. When I make a fist and I hit the enemy, Almighty God hits the enemy with me because his presence is in my fist. His presence is in my sword. His presence is in my words. I'm ready, but no, no, they, they couldn't have that. And it said, the Bible says, and they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the, unto the children of Israel, saying, this land though which we have gone to search it, a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. Well, that's actually a Genesis 6 principle. That's the same thing that was happening in Genesis 6 with the giants. While they were in bondage, the ites took over their inheritance. Oh, you While you were in bondage, you were born into sin, God had a destiny for you. God had a purpose for you. And up until your age of accountability, you were learning about sin. But the moment that you, being accountable, usually it's around the age 13, you decide to do wrong after learning what was right. The Bible says, sin revived and I died, the Apostle Paul said. From that moment, you went into bondage in Egypt. And the devil started placing things within your life to eat up your inheritance in Almighty God. Now that we're saved, it is time to, to seize our destiny and our inheritance. And God says, you've got to drive out the ones that are eating up what belongs to you. How many of us, how many of us have been in situations that uh, we should have joy? God gives you a promotion, you get a raise, somebody gives you a blessing, and everybody around you is dancing but you, and you're the one that got it. you got a giant eating your blessing, eating your inheritance. Come on now. It goes on to say, and they saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come from the giants, and we are, we are in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so were we in their sight. How did they know? Did they ask them? How did they know? Because you, you go on 40 years later after all this event happens and everybody in the promised land is freaked out that the children of Israel are coming back over to get their land. They're freaking out over it. Well, it sounds to me like maybe they weren't grasshoppers on their side after all. They assumed. They assumed because if I'm a grasshopper in my own sight, I've got to be in the enemy's sight. But God needed to open their eyes. The truth of the matter is that they were the mightiest force on the planet because if God can take a stick and an old man, 80 years old, when he went down to Egypt, let my people go, okay? That's all it took. And God brought down the greatest nation with the greatest army on the planet. What is he with a bunch of young whippersnappers that will listen to instruction, pick up a sword and fight? Come on now. It's like our special forces saying, I just don't know if I can do it. They're saying, you know what? You let me go and you take off the handcuffs and you know what? There's going to be a bunch of dead enemy. 
That's one of the things I'm reading right now with what's going on with ISIS. Our guys have been handcuffed. They can't do the job. There was one general that came up and said, you know what, 75% of our ordinance, we can't even loose on ISIS right now. And to be truthful, all it would take is us being taken off the cuffs and give me one Marine battalion, and in 30 days, they're dead meat. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I don't know about you, but I think that Marine saved. <laughs> you know, who are these uncircumcised Philistines? Well, guys, it's the same way in our lives. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Oh, you're not getting it yet. If a principality, I'm not to go up into the second heaven and do spiritual warfare there, but if they poke their nose into the first heaven, I'll be given authority here. If a watcher manifests in the first heaven, I can bind it. If a principality by, appears in the first heaven, I can bind it. it. If Satan himself, Lucifer, appears in the physical in the first realm, I have the authority to bind him. So what is a Nephilim or a Gibberim to me if I have Almighty God on the inside of me? Our problem is we have too many giants within that are eating your joy, eating your purpose, eating your destiny. So they had Gibreem. Fear caused them, guys, to do the unthinkable. They accused God. They said, you brought us out here. You brought us out of the safety of Egypt. You know, well. The stupidity of your statement. Like, you brought us out of Egypt. And now you're going to take us over there so they can kill all our children. Don't make false accusations against God. God said, you know what? I've about had my fill of you. I'm done with your generation. You're going to wander in the wilderness until you all die out. And I'm going to take the kids that you accused me of sending over there to get killed, and they're going to take the land. You don't even get your inheritance. And guys, we have had a lot of the church, the past generations, have gotten to the Jordan and said, I don't think I'm going to deal with that. I like manna. And we run from service to service because I hear there's manna falling or gold dust falling or feathers flying or anything else that might seem like the supernatural because I'm still wandering in the wilderness and I refuse to go over. Once I go over, I can create what I need for the kingdom of God there because God's flowing with me. I can create that miracle. I can create that blessing. I'm not running around like a little child from meeting to meeting to meeting hoping there's going to be a manifestation when once I cross over the Jordan, I am the kingdom in manifestation in the earth. Oh, I've had my caffeine this morning, both spiritually and physically. Past generations refused to go on because they didn't want to move past salvation. So forever it's just as I am and not who he's made me. Oh. For the most part, the church in America is stuck in the wilderness. And what is worse, they have built mega churches that have gone native. Now, gone native is a military term. You see, when, if, if I was still in the military and I'd go into the Middle East, I am an American soldier. I enforce the Constitution. I have a culture and I have a purpose that reflects in everything that I do, but... Some soldiers forget that they're Americans and go native and identify with the other culture instead of the culture that sent them. Hmm? Next thing you know, they're fighting our own soldiers. And you can't tell the difference between them and the pagans around them. We have had a church that has gone native so that we can blend in and, and let them fundal their money to us. We don't need the world's money. We need kingdom money that is produced by members of the kingdom of God whom God has blessed like Abraham in the earth. And they're the ones who are supposed to fund the kingdom, not the Illuminati. Oh, that's a whole other sermon right there. 
But guys, there's good news. There's a generation rising up. I call them the remnant. Now they have discovered that there is more. I want you to just, just let that sink in. There's more. There's more than just as I am, I come. It's as I am, I come, you have transformed me, and now out of your presence I go to accomplish your mission in the earth. The remnant have discovered that there's more, and they have readied themselves to cross over the Jordan and seize their inheritance. Now maybe for the first time you understand these words of Jesus when he said, from the days of John the Baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffereth violent and the violent take it by force for all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. Of what? The expanding of the kingdom within so it could begin influencing the world without. You're going to have to get violent on the inside of you. And you're going to have to take it by force on the inside. For a believer, deliverance is not somebody coming on the outside and taking you by the hand and saying, oh, honey, just sit here and let me cast all these demons out of your life. It is apply the kingdom. Now, I may stand with you in faith to get some of the big ones that you're not ready to get yet, but you have got to move forward. And I'm saying, you heard the boy. You heard the girl. Get. We have got to get out of this mentality of wandering in the wilderness and having everything hand to you like it's on a silver platter. You're never going to produce blessing in your life until you start working in the kingdom. That's another reason why we just run from meeting to meetings, and it's, it's almost like Ronco or some other food network, you know, the, the thing. Well, I can get three angels and five blessings here for my $50, but this one over here says I can get this for this money. Quit playing that garbage. That is wilderness theology. You're to give where God's told you to give. And you can go back to the Abraham principle. Your first line of giving is where you're spiritually fed. And then after that, you can give in a lot of different places. And sometimes quit giving to the prophets of Baal and give to somebody in need. Oh, we don't want to hear that. Yeah. Do you know some years in Israel, the tithe was 30% that year because you had the tithe to the priest. You had to th the tithe to the poor. And it was your responsibility to go out and find somebody in need and pull out your wallet and give as being led by the Holy Spirit. Oh. Huh? Well. Come on now. But quit trying to run like this is some spiritual lotto and you have finally gotten the seven magic numbers. That's crazy. You sow into the kingdom because you've been fed at that place. Which the, and Malachi says the tithe is I'm going to have an open heaven. I'm going to get more revelation so I can implement it more in my life. And while I'm learning and beginning to learn how to do, I got the almighty God devouring the, the devourer for my sex. Oh, that's where the devourers come from. Not only you rebuke, but now I've got my stick in the kingdom and I'm going to drive you out of my field. And I'm never going to let you back in again. Now principles of crossing over. You got to be delivered first. Unless you're saved, you can't move in any of this. Unless you've dealt with the cross of Christ, you can't move in any of this. Unless you have your sins covered by the blood of Jesus, you can't do any of this. The commandments of God are never for the lost. They are only for the redeemed. The voice of God is not even for the lost. Because the only word they should hear until they're saved is repent. Because they can't go another step. Oh, come on. You've got to understand the commandments of God before you cross over. Do you realize the whole purpose of Deuteronomy? Now, Moses had spent 40 years writing the first four, going into the presence of God, God dictating it, him coming back, him establishing it. Deuteronomy simply means words. And so Moses originated the concept of the Reader's Digest Condensed Version. 
He's got this new generation that's getting ready to cross over, and so he gives a summation of not only the commandments of God, but everything they have been through to make sure that they had their running shoes on when they crossed. He made sure they were established in the commandments of God and that they remembered where they had come from, what they had done, and the errors that the past generation had made. You see, I'm tired of there only being once in a generation a Lester Summerall. I am tired of there being once in a generation a Smith Wigglesworth or other mighty men of God in a generation that should produce millions of them. Because in past generations, a few men crossed over and everybody else was set content to send me back messages across the Jordan. Do you know there was actually, when it actually came time for them to cross now, they had to go back over and fight. But some of them, after they fought and one went back over the other side of the Jordan and settled there. Well, brother, I just like the way it used to be. <laughs> I'm thinking, God said your promise was on the other side. Don't go back. Well, no, we're not going to go back to Egypt. That's a little bit too far, but we just like the wilderness. Oh! Next step, how did, they, how did they cross the Jordan? The Ark of the Covenant is the representation of the throne of God in the earth. God's rulership and God's reign had to proceed before them. The only way that you can cross the Jordan is that the kingdom of God and the reign of Jesus has got to be established in your heart and proceed before anything that you do, then you can cross over. Once you cross over, you got to fight. Now here's the instructions for you, and this is found in Joshua chapter 1. Now you've, you've, you've been redeemed, you've been taught the commandments of God, You've made, you've made God your king. It's not what the world says, it was, it's what God says that matters. And you want to enforce his kingdom in everywhere you go. Now we get over here to Joshua chapter 1. And so now Joshua is giving marching orders. Moses is now dead. It's handed over to him. Now God promises that every place that the sole of your feet shall tread upon that I have given unto you as I have said through Moses. So he said, listen, every place your feet tread, every place your feet tread on the inside of you, from your will, your mind, your emotions, all this stuff belongs to you. It doesn't belong to anybody else. And as you begin to march forward, God is giving it back to you. That means the, the attitudes and the lies and the problems that you used to have in the past are no longer supposed to reign over you, that you're supposed to drive them out and you take control of them and bring them under the Lordship of Christ. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the, the river Euphrates, unto the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not be any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. And we could, we could, we could change that as he was with Jesus, he's going to be with you. Jesus went about doing good and destroying all the works of the enemy. We need to understand that we have the armor of God to raise hell, R-A-Z-E. If you're not raising hell, it's because you're out on the battlefield butt naked. Saying, what a mighty God we serve. And what you're doing is you're being the joker on the field and a joke. The enemy only gets upset when you come out in full armor and said, you said what? You said, what about my God? You're you going to do what? Not in my territory, you're not. Because there's a new sheriff in town. <laughs> you get off of my property. You get out of my thoughts. You get out of my attitudes. Guys, th this is the key to the past not holding you back anymore. This is the key to inner healing. This is the key to deprogramming. This is the key to everything. 
As long as somebody else is doing it for you, you're never free. You're dependent upon somebody else. There went 90% of the ministry out the window. Uh-huh. All this hand-holding for 40 years has got to stop. We have, we, have, we have sheep that have bleeded and bleeded and bleeded to the place that they're devouring the shepherds and the shepherds are walking off and leaving ministry because the sheep will never grow up. And there's nothing worse than a 60-year-old sheep still in diapers, although we may call them depends by then, but they have never left the nursery. Oh, I've got the fight on this morning. Verse 6, be strong and be of good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide the inheritance of the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be strong and be very courageous that thou mayest observe the whole meetings where gold dust falls. Where you can get the praise and worship just right. Where you can get somebody to come in that's just super powered. And you don't have to do anything. You're still looking for manna, Jack. But you see, in warfare, there's rules of engagement. There's doctrines of warfare. And for a soldier, it's his law. Oh! <laughs> the law is what empowers the soldier. The law is what empowers every cop that walks out there. If there was no law, there would be anarchy. And there is anarchy except for the places that the law is enforced. I'm not under the law. Yeah, you're a gangster running around in the kingdom. Well, I can do whatever I want. No, you can't. When you say, I'm free in Jesus to do whatever I want, Almighty God ain't feeling no love, Jack, because he says, here's how you love me, you keep my commandments. Oh, according to the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee, not to turn to the right of it, nor to the left of it, that thou mayest prosper, that thou mayest prosper, that thou mayest prosper, not that a boatload of money just falls from the sky, or somebody's promising you all the world if you give to their ministry, and what's amazing to me, 99.9% .9 of the time it never manifests. The one out of a million it does, boy, they get right up there on TV with them though, don't they? They're almost excited. Jimmy gave and became a millionaire. Woohoo! Well, if it was really anointed of God, you should have them, you should have to have six months of programming just to show what happened with one event. But see, what God is saying, I want you to roll up your sleeves. You got to drive out the yites before you can plant your field. Once you plant your field, the kingdom sustains you and you have whatever you need. Oh! That's going to hit home with somebody in a minute. You have, once you have the kingdom of God established within, you have driven out the ites, the word can be sown and reap 30, 60, 100 fold, but you can't do it as long as there's stony ground, which, which is ground to the, which is implements placed by the enemy to steal your seed. You gotta drive them out, you gotta break up, follow ground, and once you do, you can start producing. I am tired of Christians running from meeting to meeting wanting to get blessed. When, if you wanna see a miracle, all you should have to do is stop and turn around because you're supposed to leave a trail of them. Sinners can't get in the meeting where miracles are going on because all the saints are sitting there getting mad. You're not going to get my seat. You're not going to steal my blessing. That blessing isn't for you. Signs and wonders. Especially like miracles of healing are gifts embedded within people that have evangelistic anointing and they're not for you, believer. They're for the unbeliever to get their attention so they'll surrender to Jesus. You produce the blessing by praying, doing the word, and watching God walk you out of it. 
Oh, oh he's went to meddling, uh-huh. Verse 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. But Mike, I tithe. That it? That it? You ain't doing nothing but the tithe? Well, you're having the devourer rebuked for your sake, but you got an empty field because you're not, you're, not, you're not concentrating on the orders that you were given from headquarters and implementing them within your own sphere of influence. When you do the word, the word will work. And whatever you plant will grow what's in your field. Is it what Egypt gave you or is it what Mount Sinai gave you? says, I have commanded thee, be strong and be of good courage and be not afraid. Be thou not dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee wherever thou goest. Now here's something in reading this. Not only do I see about the commandments of God and, and how we're supposed to meditate on the law of the soldier. Marching orders. Being strong and being courageous is a choice, not a feeling. That's the truth. Joshua you choose to be courageous. When you get home every morning, when you look in the mirror in the morning, you say, I choose to be strong and I choose to be courageous today, and there ain't no giant I can't take its head off. God, you open my eyes, you show it to me, and that sucker's going down in the name of Jesus, and I'll find the right commandment, I'll find the right thing to break its power and to get it out of my life. Oh, but that's a, but, but Brother Mike, ain't there a ministry somewhere? Yes. It's waiting in you to be released. Because nobody can take authority over your spiritual territory like you can. It belongs to you. It's your inheritance. I can come alongside to supplement what you're doing, but if you're not clearing them out, I cannot clear them for you. This is a dynamic of the kingdom. You got to mark them, and you got to mark them for death. You got to mark them for expulsion. You got to then go into the presence of God and say, What is my marching orders? How do I drive them out? Now we're going to get into the next session on steps to driving them out and how that Jericho is the Old Testament perfect type and shadow of a stronghold. I'm having fun. Well, Father, we just ask that you take this word today, and Father, that you would just loose an anointing of being strong and courageous. Father, loose within us the anointing of a soldier in the kingdom of God that can take authority with the things within. And we, Father, we are commissioned by your throne, by the completed work of Jesus, to drive the ites out of our inheritance. And Father, I believe that this day the tide is turning. Father, that we're going to take up our responsibility to do it before you. And, Father, you're going to put the things in our hands that we need to do to drive them out and to be transformed by the power of God. Because every one of us have a destiny, every one of us have a purpose, and it's time to get off the bench and, get, and leave whining behind and start having a battle cry come out of our mouths. Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Father, loose your marching orders for the remnant we ask today. In Jesus' name.